Okay, so this is lecture 17 of PDEs, and today we're going to go on with our Green's functions for the one-dimensional heat equation, um, but we're going to have a look at how you construct the actual Green's function if you have a finite domain as opposed to an infinite or a semi-infinite domain that we've looked at previously. And the technique we're going to use is a different one. We saw it when we looked at the um, Laplace's Green's function on a square box as well. Um, so it's very much the same as, it, um, as that approach, and it's just a different way or a different classical way of looking for your Green's functions. And then after that, we're going to start on basic theorems for the wave equation in general. Okay, so we're back to our 1D diffusion equation. We're basically trying to solve this equation now on a finite domain. So there's our sourced heat equation. We've got it specified, the initial value problem specified on the boundary, where G is a function of X. And we're going to assume that the domain we're looking at is from 0 to A. Okay? And we're also interested in time greater than 0. And T prime, we're going to assume, is less than T. And we actually want the function at T. Okay? So we once again have the idea of your source point and your field point. You integrate over your source points, and you want the value at your field point. And the Green's function equation solves, obeys this different operator. Remember, the minus sign was switched in front of the t. That's equals to zero. And with the additional condition that at t prime equals to t, it's equals to the delta function. So that was our definition of the Green's function that we seek. And we now want to find it on um, basically at point P, which is field point, point Q is the source point, and then we showed last time that you integrate over your source points, and you can write down the general solution U, X, and T with the contribution from your initial value part plus the contribution of your forcing term F, which is integrated over the whole domain of interest, plus this term that goes on the boundary Typically, one of these to vanish depending on which boundary conditions you have chosen to specify. Okay? And there's, there's the picture. So all this stuff should be familiar from last time. What is new is actually how to go about finding what this G is that obeys this condition. And the basic approach here is we're going to expand G on a set of basis functions that obeys the boundary condition over here and over there. Okay. Um, so we have two options. You're going to either have Neumann or Dirichlet boundary conditions. If you have Neumann boundary conditions, which basically is that you specify your function's derivative, in other words, when the, the flux of heat across the boundary, um, you give that as a function of T. Um, and I'm going to assume for this particular example that you have Neumann boundary conditions on both sides, right? There's nothing to say that you can't have Neumann boundary conditions, say, over here, and Dirichlet boundary conditions over there where you specify the function. But this, for this particular example, I'm just going to assume that you have Neumann boundary conditions on both. And then what I basically, as a result, the Green's function you have, or seek, is one in which the corresponding derivatives on both boundaries are equals to zero. Okay? And the reason for that is that if that is true, then you lose this term and you only have the thing you actually know multiplied by the Green's function entering into the, um, the, the definition of the solution. Okay, and so the method I'm going to use is called the Fourier method. It is a subset of um, uh, Stumlivul methods, okay, and I'm going to get to Stumlivul theory later. I don't know if you've done it because you didn't do undergraduate here. You didn't do your undergraduate at Free State. No. So have you ever heard of Stumlivul problems? Okay, because I'm going to do it again because I know it was in this curriculum and then it was taken out and I want it back. 
Okay, so I'm going to do it quite slowly because it's, a, it's a, one of the foundational things for actually solving both ODEs and PDEs. Okay, so we'll do it quite slowly. Anyway, a Fourier method is one, one example of a Stumleville um, method of finding solutions. Okay, and the idea behind it is you're basically going to expand your Green's function. Let's just find my... You're going to expand your Green's function G in terms of basis functions that obey the boundary conditions. Okay, so in this case, do we want basis functions that have its derivative vanishing at zero and at A, and a natural way of doing it um, is to choose the basis functions to be cos of n pi x prime over A. Okay, so the derivative of cos is sine, and sine at 0 and sine at x equals to a, so sine of n pi or 0, so the boundary conditions are satisfied. If you were looking at an example where you had, um, uh, what do you call it, where you had Dirichlet boundary conditions over here, you would, make your, you would replace cos with sine over there. And if you had the case where you had one Dirichlet and one Neumann boundary conditions, you would also have cos, but you would actually shift it, like plus 2 pi. So you would actually shift this thing. It would be like n pi plus a half, um, so that you, your boundary conditions are satisfied. So all the methods on this finite domain can actually be done by choosing either cos basis functions or sine basis functions or the combination of the two. Okay. Um, Okay, so now the thing is, if you make this expansion, the theorems that we will prove in the subsequent lecture, that this is expansion is complete in the sense, if you keep enough terms, you can get to arbitrary accuracy, and um, there's a prescription for actually getting these uh, coefficients that we're going to use now, if you're given the function you're expanding. And I'll actually derive where it comes from, just now I'm just going to give it. Okay, so... This expansion, the first term, n equals to zero, you basically have a constant, okay, and that is simply the average value of the function, so that's simply g0 is equals to 1 over a, the integral from zero to a of g dx, okay, and the other coefficients that enter there is simply um, g of m equals to 1 over 2a, g times cos of m pi x prime over a dx with m is greater than zero, okay? So this is the definition of those coefficients over there, and you can actually prove that this definition works simply by substituting g in there. Okay, so let's just check that that works, and the way we do it is we put this g expression, in other words, this whole sum, in there, multiply by cos of m pi x prime over a, integrate from 0 to a, um, over dx prime. And if you do that, you can swap your summation and your integration because it's a finite integral and a convergent sum. And you can also take out everything that's not dependent on x prime. So you can actually take this coefficient out because it's not dependent on x prime. If you integrate this thing, that is zero if n is not equals to m or a over two if they are equal. Okay, and the way I write that is this way. Okay, so you have the sum over the, the co-expansion coefficient um, times a over two, um, the delta function of m over n, which means it's only non-zero if m equals n, so that's basically equals to GM. So that's just to verify that this definition of how you get the expansion coefficients given the function is in fact accurate. And so you could either, what we basically do is you could either, you could have this definition of G that is the expansion of the coefficients and you now want to know you don't know what G is. The only thing you know about G is that it satisfies um, the boundary conditions because of the way you've chosen the expansion. And you want to find a G that basically satisfies this differential equation. 
and you are going to use this differential equation as well as this condition to find out what the um, expansion coefficients actually are. Okay, and the way you do it is simply to put uh, or sort of put this differential equation for G and work out its projection onto your basis functions. So that's effectively what I've done there. So you basically take the differential equation, you multiply it by cos m pi x prime, and the first thing you can see is here's two derivatives with x prime. So the natural thing is you integrate by parts twice. So you ch shift the derivative operator onto cos of m pi x prime, just like we did in a previous example. And all the boundary terms, because they contain the derivative of cos or the derivative of, of g, they always vanish. Okay, so what you have then is this um, minus kappa um, dxx prime on cos, which is just minus cos of n pi x prime and then times g, and that's actually the definition of gm, right? So you have minus kappa gm times this thing that comes from the derivatives, and the second term plus the second term, which is just ddt g, but the ddt you can take, once again, outside the integral sign, and you're just simply left with a definition of gm and you take the time derivative of that. So you have transformed this equation into an um, a algebraic equation in uh, M and a derivative in time that actually determines the individual coefficients of your expansion. So you now have a differential equation for the coefficients of your expansion, and you know that that's equals to zero because your differential equation is equals to zero. Okay, so in some sense, it's very clever. You simplify the problem, you expand it, and then for each expansion coefficient, which is now dependent on one less variable, you have a differential equation, which is a very nice, easy differential equation to solve because it's just derivative of time of a function of time is, equal, is proportional to a constant times the function. So you can have that, which is basically this thing. You basically have GMT prime over gm is equals to a constant, and so you just have an exponential, okay? So you have that g is a constant uh, with respect to t prime, so a function of x and t times e to the t prime times this coefficient. Okay, is this clear before I go on? Okay, so I've got one step further. I've got now, I've got g x t x prime t prime is the x expansion in terms of cos, and I've got, I know more, I know the dependence on t prime of this expansion, and it's just written this way, okay? And I've used all the information about the derivative operator, the piece of information I have not yet used, is the fact that g at t prime equals to t is the delta function of x prime minus x, okay? And that's going to help me go even further and determine what this am of x and t are. Okay, so that's what we do next. So this is just exactly what was on the previous slide. Here I've substituted in what g is in terms of my exponential that I've now got, times cos n pi x of um, prime over a. And just out of curiosity, note that for the Green's function, for the heat equation, this is actually what you expect, right? If you go back to the cell similar solution, you also had basically E of t in the exponent, E of kappa t in the exponent, okay? So it is something you actually expect to find in the heat equation. Okay. N different solution, but same kind of fall off in time. And it has to do with how the heat diffuses away from a point. Okay, so now we want to go and we want to impose this boundary condition. 
And to impose this boundary condition, remember I said a delta function only makes a sense under an integration sign because it's not a function, it's a distribution. So the way we do it is we basically evaluate g at t equals to t prime. Okay? And we evaluate the coefficients of g there by looking at the projection onto the basis function. So we have that g0 at t equals to t prime, because remember, these things are still dependent on t. So now at t equals to t prime, your g0 is simply the integral from 0 to a times a delta function of x prime minus x. And because you assume your um, source term is in the domain, there it is, the value is 1, and you're left with 1 over a. Okay, so this coefficient a0 um, is simply equals to 1 over a. Okay, and the second one you do exactly the same thing. You evaluate g at t prime equals to t times cos n pi x prime over a, and there it's your delta function times cos n pi x prime over a, and you have that the, the convolution of the delta function is merely the function but evaluated at x. So you have that that is cos uh, m pi x over a. Okay. And at the same time, you can put this expression, sorry, this expression into the same thing. Okay. So you have that um, this expression with t equals to t prime, okay, so that's where your condition at t equals t prime, that's already been put in there, is equals to this integral, which is just the Dirac, um, or the delta function, and you have that um, at t equals to t prime, this thing, basically g projected onto the basis function, is simply a over 2 a m x t e to the kappa t m pi over a squared. Okay, so note this is t rather than t prime over there, and that switch has happened because you're working on that upper lid of t equals to t prime, and you know that this thing then must be equals to that. So you're left with a m equals to cos m pi x over a um, times a of 2 over a times e to the minus kappa t pi m pi over a squared. Okay, so you have literally used that delta function boundary condition to actually set all of the ams and give them a functional dependence. And what is very nice, remember your, when we started working with Green's functions, I said we, uh, there was a lecture on the symmetry properties of Green's functions. In other words, if you change the source and the target, uh, the source point and the field point, then the function should look the same. And therefore, you are very relieved when you have AM having the symmetry coming in because you expect it to be there. Okay. So... Um, we now have our full Green's function for a case with, we have a finite domain with um, Neumann boundary conditions. Here you have your first term in the series, which is the G0 term, it's just the 1 over A, plus 2 over A there, times um, e to the kappa T prime um, in pi over A squared, times this contribution that comes from the AM, so there we have put them together, times the AM's cos um, n pi x times the one in x prime, which was your original expansion assumption coming over there. Nice and symmetric, um, obeys the boundary conditions, obeys the differential operator, and obeys the condition at t equals to t prime. Okay, so happy. Questions before I go on. Okay, so now I just want to do the same thing as, oh, okay, and then this is just 
the full solution written out in this case where I've simply put in the greens function in at the various places. So this is the source term or the initial condition. So it's the greens function evaluated at t prime equals to zero. So that's the one thing to look at there. This is the forcing term. So it is the general greens function evaluated over there. And then this is the boundary term. And what is interesting with the boundary term is you can actually combine the two. So it's the boundary on the one side minus the boundary on the other side plus um, your Green's function evaluated at x equals to um, 0, okay, which is basically the coefficient there, and x equals to, sorry, x prime equals to a, okay, and that's this coefficient over here, so that's b1, okay. And so what you basically get is a solution that's equals to this whole big mess. What is interesting is that it is actually an expansion for the solution itself, like over here in the integrals, the integrals are going over x prime, okay. So terms that don't depend on x prime, you can actually take out. So you can, for all these integrals, you can take the sum term outside the integration. You can also take the cos n pi x term outside of the integral. And you can take this e to the kappa minus t n pi over a squared term also out of the integral. So you're actually left with a series times some integral g of x which is actually being projected onto the basis. Okay. So, and that you're going to see in, as I actually do a specific example, it's going to become clearer. But you can basically rearrange that thing, be taking everything except for the things that depend on x prime out of the integration sign. Okay, so now I just want to look at a specific example. Let's suppose we set kappa equals to 1 and the domain size, A equals to 6. And we start with G of X um, equals to that. Okay, so I'm highly going to ad strongly advise you to try and actually do this yourself as well. Um, so we start with G of X equals to that. And so what we do, and we're going to just start, ignore the boundary conditions to start with B1 and B0 is equals to 0. And so the actual solution we can write down as um, beta 0 times e to the minus t n pi over 6 squared, where I've taken this out, times that cos n pi x over 6, which I've also taken out, times this other thing beta n, which is what results from the integral with g of x. Okay, and there I'm just going to write them down. So beta zero is simply the average value of what this integral is. Okay, and I can work that integral out um, numerically, or I can use the definition of my error function. Remember, I said when we were deriving the what the delta def the, the limiting set of functions to the delta Dirac distribution, I said the integral of that is basically your error function. So the integral of your Gaussians are the error function. And there we have it. And you can ask MATLAB or any function to evaluate it or look it up. You can even just type into Google and they'll tell you what the, the value actually is. And it's there. Okay. So that's the average value. That's beta zero. And similarly, the beta n is simply equals to cos n pi x prime over 6 times your initial values integrated with your initial function over there. And you can work that thing out as well simply by writing cos out as e to the i x, or sort of in the exponential form, combining it with this thing and completing the square and you can show that it's equals to your error function 
two different error functions, which actually comes from exactly the same integral. And so you can actually work, evaluate all of these things and get out the values for all your error functions or for all your coefficients. All the even ones have values, all the odd ones are zero because essentially you don't have odd terms entering into the initial hump. And there is what I've done over here just to show you, I've simply, this is simply taking an expansion of your initial Gaussian on the basis functions of cos by taking out these integrals. And after I've kept 12 terms, what I basically have, that's the exact Gaussian, the blue, and this is the dotted one, um, the, which is basically the approximation. So there, there's a very small error there. And that is an essential thing. Before you go on, always with this type of thing, you must get a good approximation for all your functions projected onto the basis. And make sure, either by plotting them or working out the maximum error, that, that the error is small before you go on. Otherwise, you won't get an accurate picture of what the solution is. But the cool thing is, once you have these actual coefficients, you effectively put them in here and you have the solution. Okay, so the, th the nice thing is you check that you have enough coefficients simply by making sure you have a series for your initial condition that's accurate. Once you've checked that, you know that um, you have an accurate enough thing to actually write down the solution, and the solution looks like that. Okay, so this solution was made by literally plotting this series is contour lines given the expansion I've chosen. And if you look at the solution, remember the solutions from last time that, you should, that I said you should try and print out. Remember with the infinite domain, there was nothing weird happening on the boundary. With a semi-infinite domain, if you had Neumann boundary conditions, these contours always met at 90 degrees because you had specified that the function does not change over the boundary. And this is exactly what you see and with Dirichlet boundary conditions, which you must probably get in a problem set, they were vertical. There was, it was, you basically get specified that the function was zero on the boundary. Okay, so finite domain. Um, if you just think about it intuitively, the solution on a finite domain is going to be different in a small way from the solution on an infinite domain or a semi-infinite domain because the heat has a li more limited space of which way to flow. Um, and that you can actually see um, also, so you'll see that the diff there are slight differences between this thing than there was on the semi-infinite domain. And that's, what it, that's the result. But what is uncanny is, well, it's not uncanny, it's, it's exactly what you expect. But it's still kind of nice to see that this solution is written in a form that looks actually dramatically different from the semi-infinite um, Green's functions, and yet... The, the, the actual answer or the if physics of the answer has not changed very much. Okay, so now let's add an additional term. Let's look at the boundary term. And remember, that's also an integral over the boundary term times some other things that I um, sort of derived on the previous page. And if you look at, write it down just for the one boundary term, so I'm saying only there's something happening here on the right and si on the left hand side, and the other one remains zero. So I only have one contribution. I then get a series expansion that looks exactly the same for its time dependence and its spatial dependence, but you have these coefficients alpha, which also come from just keeping the part that's dependent on x prime on the previous slide, and you have that the alpha zero is just the Green's function on the boundaries. Um, times um, the derivative that's given, basically B0 of T. Um, and then you have this other one, alpha N, which is also just this integral of the Green's function on the boundaries time derivative or time component times E to the T prime in pi of A. Okay, you once again work out these integrals um, they are once again error functions, okay, because it's the same 
type of integral, which is why I chose the example because it's easy to work out. And I'll try and choose examples for you guys that the integrals are easy as well. Um, but you can always do it. Okay. And so if you look at this, these terms, then once again, you check first that your initial, the boundary term has been expanded. You keep enough coefficients that the boundary term has been expanded accurately. And then you just put it into over there, work out the series, and you can actually generate the, um, what the contours look like and what the solution looks like over here. And this is, I mean, the, the magnitude of the functions that I put in are the same as the other examples. So you can see there are slight differences, but not much. Okay, so the boundaries make a difference, but not a huge one. Um, and you can solve it in all cases. Questions now? Once again, go through it on your own. Okay, make sure you understand the steps. If there's stuff you don't understand, come and ask me. Okay, and I think I will be making a problem set that actually gives you another example, like the you can work out the Neumann boundary conditions with sign. And it's actually quite satisfying um, because you can get nice exact answers for it. Right. Now we've done elliptic, which is Laplace's equation. We've done um, uh, hyper, uh, parabolic, which is the heat equation. And we're going to transition to doing the wave equation. We've basically done the wave equation a little bit when we looked at D'Alembre's solution. Um, but we're going to look at it in two and three dimensions as well. And, I'm not going to, and we're going to do the Green's functions. And after that, um, we're going to do another technique, which is quick and dirty. It's actually the first technique I try whenever I... It's not quick and dirty. It's beautiful. Uh, it's the first technique I try whenever I get a differential equation. It's called separation of variables. It's very dependent on the coordinates the system has been written in and a whole bunch of other things. So we, that's just that's sort of the future music of what we're going to do. Um, but for now, let's just introduce the wave equation and let me tell you about it. I mean, if I had to pick one, wave equ one equation that was maybe the most important linear equation that has sculpted the way we think about the world and it permitted us to describe things. It's the wave equation, right? Because it appears in ordinary water waves, it appears in sound waves, it appears in um, electromagnetic waves, it appears in electric fields, and then generalizations of it appear in gravitation as well. So immensely important. Its properties have also changed what we think about of causality, how you can have waves propagated from one point to the other. Like, whereas you had, with your elliptic equations, the boundary conditions determined everything. With your heat equations, the boundary conditions were important, and, um, but it also, you had this idea that there was a directionality in, um, in, in time, you know, right? There was a very clear thing, heat tends to disperse. The wave equation is... Um, reversible, right? If you change t with minus t, um, it remains unchanged. But the way information propagates in it gives us the idea of what causality is. You have a very clear idea that you have a point in a wave equation that's influenced by past initial conditions in the past in a certain range, region. And you, for that point, it can only influence certain initial conditions or certain conditions in the future. So there is an idea of causality that is fundamental in the wave equation that was incorporated in a whole bunch of other theories as well. So just, oh, there we go. There's the source-free wave equation. And it's written like this. And that's that Laplace operator. And it looks different in different types of coordinate systems. But the amazing thing is that the properties are basically unchanged. Right, there's certain fundamental things, and that's why you write it this way, of what the wave equation does, um, regardless of coordinate systems. Just as when we looked at the solutions to our heat equation, there were certain properties of the heat equation that looked similar, even though we had vastly different Green's functions for different boundary conditions presenting it, um, or representing the solution. The same thing is true of the wave equation. Okay. The source-free one, the general one, where the source, which we're actually going to solve using Green's function, is written that way, where R is a vector 
to a particular point, either in the two-dimensional or three-dimensional space. And so I'm just going to write out the various disguises of the wave equation so that if you come across it, you know what it looks like. You're like, oh, gotcha. Um, so this is the 1D one that we looked at first, right? Um, it was fully solved by D'Alembre, a French guy, in 1717. Okay, and that was the solution that you were introduced to write, well, in a, some, some of the earlier lectures. And I'll give you a picture of him now. Now, he looks very charming. Um, this is the two-dimensional wave equation. And the thing I wanted to underline here is this is what it looks like if you've written out this operator in Cartesian coordinates. So it's just uxx, uiy. Um, if you write it out in polar coordinates, such as when you're describing motion on a circular membrane, which is actually a problem um, that we're going to look at, um, it looks like this. Okay, so same basic operator, but in different coordinates, it looks vastly different. And this makes finding solutions for it a little bit more complicated. In fact, the, the, the expression of the solution depends quite dramatically on the boundary conditions. Okay, so here we go. And just to give you an idea of what the solutions look like, Typically for the wave equation, if you and this is just a circular membrane, you have this idea of a spatial mode, just like a cos or whatever. It's easier sometimes to just think of it on a string for now, but it's, we'll generalize it. You basically, you have this idea that you have a solution. It has a number of zero points as it crosses the axes, and the, a particular solution has a particular frequency, and it tends to oscillate up and down. Okay? This is not rigorous. We're going to make it rigorous when we do the Strom-Nubel theory, but it's just to give you an idea. So, for example, suppose a very classical circular membrane is a drum. Um, and so if you are a really good drummer, you can excite different ones of these modes. Okay? So the, the basic, the fundamental mode is just the, the whole surface going up and down, then you can have, if you look at them where they play they, with their sticks, there's different places where you hit the drum and you're basically exciting the different modes. So you can excite this one where you sort of have it doing that and um, you have more modes. This typically has a higher frequency and as you go on. And you don't just have symmetrical modes like in radially. You can have like quarters of the drum go up and down. And this was a huge thing people studied when they made drums. They also solved the wave equation when they made bells. When they, like in the ancient place times when they had these huge churches and these massive bells, it was like the town's symbol, status symbol. Um, uh, when, and they had to, there was, there's a lot of literature that's actually gone into how you make the shape of the bell that it hits a certain note. And it was quite an expensive exercise because there's a lot of iron that goes into making a bell. So if you cast it wrong, you were in really big trouble. Um, so yeah, there's a whole literature back in the 1700s or so of how you like make this bell. A lot of it was empirical, but a lot of it people actually tried to solve the equations as well. Another interesting drum, I don't know if you know anything about Indian music. They have this drum that they call the tabla. It's like a round drum like this. And then in the side of it, they have like a, a little round circle. And that's made out of rice base. It's just a thickening on the membrane. And if you get a person that can play the, the thing really well, they beat it and it sounds like an ordinary drum. But if they hit this thing like, I don't know, they like, there's this technique where you just like toss it sideways, this little thing. It excites a very, very high frequency, and the, the, the drum literally smells, sells like a bell. It's a beautiful thing. Um, and that's all that they've done there is they found a way of exciting a very high frequency in that drum, and it makes a completely different sound. In fact, frequencies that aren't normally excited, they, they get to do. And it all comes down to what actually modes the solution can make. That's dependent on the equations. And that's dependent on the shape of the thing as well. Okay, so we're going to have a little bit of a more detailed look at that. And that's why I want to do the Strom-Newell theory, because it has 
a fundamental thing. Like, for example, another example. Um, the wave equation appears often, because it's a linear equation where you have small perturbations. Say you have something that's solid, like an airplane, or a, the, no, the one that they've recently done, the SKA dishes, like the Meerkat telescope in the Karoo has all these dishes. And what they typically do is they have a stationary solution for the dish, but what happens if wind blows over it, then you move the dish a little bit. And the initial motion of that dish is obeyed by the wave equation, just when the motion is small. Um, and so they want to see what happens if wind blows over the dish that it doesn't make it completely unstable. So they actually solve that wave equation with a very funny geometry, right? They have to do it numerically. And they can actually see where, how this thing is going to start vibrating. And then they can calculate that if the wind blows with a certain speed, they eventually, and I think it's something like 15 kilometers an hour, or no more, it's usually 15 miles an hour, then they actually have to store the telescope because the thing is going to start oscillating like this and it's going to rip the telescope apart. So a lot of safety things actually come when you solve the wave equation to deal with the perturbations in engineering off the, um, off the structure. Another place where it's very important is flutter aircrafts. Um, if wind blows over it, it also excites waves, and that's described by the wave equation. And so you basically solve the wave equation in a, the geometry around the aircraft to actually try and see how, how, in what, how you must fly if the wind gets too much to try, or how you, actually in this case, it's how you design the wing so that this doesn't occur. Um, so there's a lot of applications, and a lot of people that do like scientific modeling um, and stuff do the wave equation. So if ever you're going to start modeling things, in biology or anywhere, you're basically going to encounter the wave equation and you're going to know how to solve it. How to solve it. And one method is, if you have a nice geometry, is these analytic methods you're learning now, if you have a more complicated geometry, then you have going to be using numerical methods to try and solve it. But fundamentally important equation. Okay. There is our charming Frenchman that worked out the first solution. And just... Um, the place where I actually got these pictures, this is, uh, comes from Wikipedia, but what's nice is they actually give you how they're oscillating. So you can see that if you go there, it's got a gif that I couldn't get into my slideshow. But you can see that this one oscillates slowly as the front lowest thing of the drum. And these guys oscillate faster and faster. And we're actually going to work out their frequencies in what comes. Um, and... The, just to complete the slide, what we're basically going to do is, um, this, in three dimensions, you can either write it in polar coordinates or you have another thing. You typically use polar coordinates if you look at the wave equation in a cylinder. So a lot of buildings, you actually use that. You use spherical equa uh, coordinates if you look at the wave equation in um, oscillations of stars, like a round fluid you want to use um, spherical coordinates. And they also have a different set of frequencies. In fact, the frequencies of the sun, people study a whole bunch. And, and they are exactly very close to what you would just estimate from the, the spherical coordinates. Okay. So I think I'm going to do the uniqueness theorems, which is just one slide for the wave equation, and then go on the next time with actually how we solve the Green's function. So... Basically, the uniqueness theorem is also there, just like we had in heat and the um, uh, Laplace's equation. It largely follows from the Laplace's equation, but I just want to give it to you for completeness because it introduces the idea of energy, which is often associated with waves. Okay, so the uniqueness equation, and this I'm somewhere going to do in the n-dimensional case, right? It's valid for any of the dimensions. All the other ones, the heat equation and the Laplace equation, it's also true. The uniqueness theorem is valid in any dimensions. It just happens that I did it to, make, to introduce the idea slowly in a fixed dimension, but the techniques are general. And here I'm just going to give the general one. Okay, so once again, let us consider two solutions to the wave equation, and let us consider what happens if where U is the difference between the two of them. The, way, the solutions themselves may be the solutions of a wave equation with a, 
um, with a source, and but the difference will obey um, the wave equation just that source three. We're going to assume u1 and u2 have the same boundary, so and as well as initial conditions. Okay, so we basically have this situation. Um, we're going to have let's for example we want to make it in a six-sided domain just to get a little bit more abstract. We have our initial condition that's specified over here at time equals to zero. We have a net at each time, say for example here, the spatial domain I'm going to call omega t. So that's basically your x, y, and z coordinates or your x and y coordinates if you're in two dimensions. Okay, And the boundary of that spatial domain at a specific point I'm going to call gamma t. Okay, So that's just the geometry of what we have. And u1 and u2 obey this in the whole domain. You know the value over here, the initial condition, and you know the value or its the normal derivative, how it changes over the boundary over here. Okay. And so what you have, and that's just what I've said, the boundary conditions are either the function itself or the normal derivative. Um, on gamma t, and you know that for all t, the initial conditions is just u at um, t equals to zero. And remember I said if you specify initial conditions because it's a second order derivative, you've got to specify both the function and its derivative. You've got to spe specify everything up to the highest derivative minus one that appears in your differential operator. And so here I've specified both. Um, and you have that on domain omega zero. So I've called this integration domain omega t and this initial one omega zero. And you have that the difference between two functions is simply obeying the wave equation without source. Okay, so we have that. And we now want to show basically that u is, remains identically zero. But there is one additional thing is for the purposes of this proof, um, I am going to assume that our domain remains constant in time. I mean, you could imagine a domain that sort of does like a balloon that changes. A uniqueness proof exists for that too. It's just simply that technically it's easier to prove this thing and it's enough for my purposes to illustrate what's going on. Um, so the first initial problems that you'll get is your domain remains constant in time. So we're going to do that one. Places where the domain doesn't obey this assumption is sort of, for example, actually waves traveling through our universe from the beginning of time because there the actual domain was increasing. So you wouldn't be able to use it there, but a proof does exist for that. Okay. So there is a uniqueness proof there as well. It's just that for this particular example, it's simply easier not to cope with that. Okay. So I'm going, to suppose, I'm going to assume this, and this assumption is just there to make the actual mathematics more transparent and the arguments clearer for a first go. Okay, so the way we prove it is we're going to define something that we call the energy, okay? Or I'm going to call it E of T. Um, it relates to the energy of the membrane. Um, and... It's basically defined like this. I'm going to say, let's start over here. And you can see why it's the energy. It's basically uh, U derivative with respect to time squared. So that's your kinetic energy. And it's basically the norm of the gradient. So that's how tense the, how the thing is moving. Um, that, okay, so the reason for choosing this, you can either view it as that way, or you can actually simply view it as a mathematical thing that, was u that can be used that is positive, right? This term is squared. You basically have ux squared plus uy plus uz squared. So this thing is also a norm, so it's squared. So it's basically an integral over a positive thing that we're going to use as a tool to prove uniqueness. Okay. Um, so what we're going to do is let us differentiate this thing with respect to time. So this is just a definition of what E of T is. We're going to differentiate it with respect to time, 
And here we have why I made this assumption that the thing remains constant. Okay, because if um, the domain was dependent on time, you would have an additional term when you differentiate this thing that accounted for the boundary changing. You can do it, you can drag it along and you get the same result. It's just more complicated, I'm just ignoring that for now. Okay, so the time derivative if omega t is constant or equals the initial domain, it can just go inside the integration and so there you have the half cancels with the two, you have ut, utt over c squared plus the gradient of u dotted in with the gradient of ut times ds. And now what we do is we then use the actual equation we know u to obey, in other words, this one, to replace utt with the Laplacian. So we're left with this thing. And we're also going to go and then basically observe that this thing is actually a complete differential. Okay, so you can write that like this. Simply, but if you differentiate this thing, you get, if you hit the gradient of the divergence operator onto the, the function, you get ut dotted in with the gradient of u, which is that term. If you take the divergence of your gradient over the you have the Laplace operator times ut. Okay. And this is now nice because you can apply the divergence theorem and get an expression for this thing on the boundary and you get that. Okay, so you apply the divergence theorem and you take the volume integral to the integral on the boundary where you basically have ut times the gradient of u dotted in with the, bound, with the normal to the boundary and that's exactly your normal derivative. Okay. So we now have a reasonably simple expression for how the energy changes as uh, things that basically go out in the boundary. And it makes sense, once again, the interpretation that this, in fact, is the energy. It's simply um, equal, and how the energy changes is simply the flux of sort of velocity out of the boundary. Okay. So now let's have a look at it. We have two possible boundary conditions if we go back here. We could either specify that u equals to zero on gamma t, or un equals to zero on gamma t. Okay? If we have the first one, we basically have u equals to zero on gamma t for all t, which then implies that the derivative of u with respect to t is zero, because u is just a constant. So then that term vanishes, and the integral is zero. If we have the other case, where u of n is equals to zero on the boundary, this thing just automatically vanishes, so e dot is also zero. So it doesn't matter what boundary condition we have, um, we always have that e dot is equals to zero. Okay, so there's the first one, ut is equals to zero. If u is zero or un is equals to zero on the boundary, just a given, in both cases we have e dot is equals to zero. So the energy does not change. And what that basically means is that the energy is equals to the energy um, initially, which is constant, and we can now work out what the initial energy is. Okay, so at time t equals to zero, you actually, and the reason we do that is that at time t equals to zero, you're actually given both u and therefore implicitly the gradient of u, and you're given ut. Okay, so at times t equals to zero, u is equals to zero on omega zero. Therefore, it's a constant function. Therefore, the gradient is zero. And you also have the derivative is zero just from the initial conditions. And then we, therefore, we have that the energy on the initial domain is just zero plus zero is equals to zero. Okay. And now the final part of the argument is we know that for all t as a result, this integral must vanish. Okay. And this integral, which is the sum of squares, is, it's only possible that it vanishes identically if every component that is squared is actually zero. So this is an argument we had before, 
So that means that u of t is equal to zero, u and the gradient of u is equal to zero, and u is constant. And the constant is zero, and we are done. It proves uniqueness. So um, we know at least that if we find a solution for the wave equation, it's the unique solution, and we can stop there. And that's where we're going to stop for this lecture and go start finding the unique solutions the next time. Okay, questions about this one? You should be quite familiar with uniqueness theorems by now. Um, this is the last one I'm going to be doing for you. <laughs> but it's, it's basically the last one you need. It's just, it's very, very useful to have. Main takeaway, it happens whenever, you, or main hint, it happens whenever you actually have a linear equation, regardless of dimensionality. But it is useful to see the techniques you're actually using to prove them. Okay, they are different for the different types of solutions. Cool, done, thank you. Um, yes. Uh, 